I think this book is so particularly rich because it really circulates around a lot of different tensions and oppositions at the same time that it breaks down the kind of binaries that are holding these tensions and oppositions in place. Disha, so we see a real tension between speech and silence. We see a tension between presence and absence. There's this contradiction of, of, of um, heritage, you know, being tied to one's past, legacy, memory, but also self-creation, self-liberation. There's memory, which is in tension with imagination, and there's centrally dire, desire, which is in tension with the repression of this desire itself. We have so much to get into, but I want to start on a pretty simple level with the title of the book itself. Um, and Disha, I'm hoping you can set the scene for us because the title is quite phenomenal. The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. These, this word church ladies, what does that evoke for you? Who are these ladies? Why are you calling them ladies? Um, and what does secrets mean to you? So first, Emily, thank you for having me and thank you for your kind words um, about my collection. Um, so my agent, Danielle Chiadi and I have a disagreement about who came up with the title because <laughs> really we're both, you know, uh, of an age where we don't remember. Uh -huh. she, I came up with it. I think she came up with it. We don't know. <laughs> we can't think, well, you're both trying to compliment each other. <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, because um, the oldest story in that collection, I probably started around 2014, 2015. So, um, and even when I started, I didn't know I was writing a collection. Yes. Um, and so I was, I grew up in the church. I was sent to church by my mother and my grandmother who raised me. I was in the church until I was 35 years old. Um, so in many respects, I was a church lady. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and so I, the, they show my stories. They've always shown up in my stories, but mm -hmm. I never, but I just mainly, mainly thought of them as these are the women who were integral to my upbringing. These were mm. the women, some in the church, some outside of the church, but all still tied to the church. Because even if you no longer went to church, you as a child, you did. You know, at some point, someone in your life um, was involved in the church. So some of the women, I call them church lady adjacent, where someone in, <laughs> who's you know, influential in their lives um, you know, uh, was a church lady. So uh -huh. um, I, you know, when we, church lady in our culture, um, you think either, depending on your age, Dana Carvey, you know, the church lady on Saturday Night Live, you know, <laughs> it's not special, you know, or Tammy Faye Baker, you know, but for, uh, for folks in the Black church, um, you know, it's a, it evokes a different view of, of church ladies. We think the big hats, we think dress to the nines, we think, be, be, you know, very, you know, um, prim, depending on the, the tradition that you're a part of, um, which Protestant tradition you're a part of, uh, the church ladies might have been those ladies who, if you, they walked past the pews and your knees were showing because your skirt was too short, they would bring a handkerchief and just <laughs> drop it on your lap very passive aggressively uh -huh. um they were the ones who you know ran the church you know black church here in the u.s uh 80 percent of the membership is women but the leadership doesn't reflect that the leadership is primarily men hmm. um, and so they ran the church um, and they were also women of contradictions, right? So some of some folks have shared with me, you know, my grandmother was a church lady. And as soon as, you know, church was out, she and her friends would go across the street and smoke a cigarette, you know? So they were, they were universes and multitudes in and of themselves. And mm -hmm. so um, for the book, I, you know, so I had always been writing about these women because um, I left home for college. I never went back full time. I never went back other to visit. I left the South. I left my past in a way, but I, it stayed with me in those, in the in memories of these women and my curiosity about them as a child and as a, and a later as an adolescent. And then when I became a woman and a mother and a church lady of sorts. Um, I'm, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to be and still curious about them. And that curiosity is what was driving my stories, memory and curiosity and imagination. And um, and I, I, when I was younger, I would wonder about these women. I'd wonder about their sex lives because mm -hmm. I was curious myself. Like, 
hear all these rules about what not to do, but your body is telling you something no, else. Yes, right? exactly. Yes. And there's that tension you were talking about. Um, and I used to be so curious and I would never ask because I knew I should not. Um, you know, how did they maintain that tension? You know, if they were single or widowed or divorced, you know, and you're not supposed to have sex unless you're married, what did they do with that? Did they masturbate? Did they have sex with other women? You know, what was it? Um, and so I carried those questions forward with me as well. And then I became a woman and understood how one might navigate these things. And that became sort of the impetus for these early stories, even as early as 2000 when I started writing um, uh, in general. And so um, fast forward um, in 20, 2007, I was working on a novel and the main character was wife. And I wrote the beginning of that novel. I wrote the end of that novel. I could not nail the middle for lots of reasons that I now understand. Uh -huh. I had an agent because my um, ex-husband and I had um, published um, a co-parenting book. Yes. So it was a nonfiction book. Um, and my agent knew I was working on a novel. And she was like, when you have that novel ready, I'm ready. And I was just <laughs> stalling and stalling and making excuses. But I was also writing some short stories. Yeah. And so because my agent eyes and she had read some of the story, she said, you know, while you're on hiatus from the novel, which is being very diplomatic um, for her to say it that way, uh -huh. um, I really like those church lady stories. So she called them that. I and see. I was like, huh, you know, I, yeah, you know, there, I think there is something there. And she said, maybe you could get really intentional and build a collection of stories about these church ladies, about black women and sex in the black church. Mm. And suddenly that felt more doable than figure out this novel that has stumped me for so many years. Mm. I got excited about the stories. And then um, because I'm a good little girl scout, she gave me homework. Uh -huh. I, I used to get excited about homework. And she <laughs> said, if you get three church of these church lady stories published, um, we'll have enough uh, to go to market and get a book deal um, based on a partial manuscript. You don't even have to, you know, have a whole manuscript, but if you get three of them published. And so I had a very specific task. Yeah. And I could do that. I did not know how to write the middle of that novel. Yeah. So that's how we landed on church ladies. Um, oh. And somebody at some point said the secret lives of church ladies. And we we're like, yes. And we went with that. It. It's perfect. It's so interesting. I love hearing about the the kind of organicity of, of how this came to be, because I think it's so resonant with one of the central arguments of the book, if one could claim that the book has an argument, which is kind of that one should follow the inclinations of nature or that one should not be fighting against the things that one's body is telling them to do. And I love what you said about curiosity um, and how to me, this notion of curiosity seems also synonymous with identifying contradictions where you've seen something that didn't make sense. These two things yeah. that were clearly in contradiction with one another and that no one else was addressing or talking about. And I think that that's also really visible in this work. When I was talking earlier about notions of speech and silence, so much of what happens in this work is things that are, things that are happening in the real world, things that are physical, tangible material are at a bit of a dissonance with the spoken world, with the things that are articulated um, which the, that people are willing to address. And oftentimes between the characters, what we see is that they refuse to speak about what is visibly before them, what is plain and clear. Um, and it's interesting because we see this, for example, with the first story with Eula, um, when they refuse to speak about the sex that they're having with one another. Um, we see this with the Peach Cobbler story, um, when she refuses to address the fact that her mother is having sex with this man that she perceives to be God. We see this in Snowfall when the mother refuses to learn what Rhonda's name is, or she refuses to name Rhonda as the partner of the narrator. Um, and it's so interesting because I think that there's a tension here between refusing to speak something and then also not being willing to speak something or not being able to speak something, lacking the vocabulary lacking the capacity to articulate the experience that you're having. How do you see these limits between refusing to speak and not being able to speak 
how are those frayed in this book? How do you play with those limits? Um, where, where do you establish them and where do you start to break them down? You know, the, I, I appreciate that observation um, of those two, um, you know, phenomena, I guess. Mm. And they're both very much part of, um, was part of my Black church experience growing up. And, and in some ways, it's still contemporary to the Black church. And not just myself, but, you know, other women that I know. Um, the curiosity, the questions, um, as I said, I didn't speak them. I didn't ask, I knew better than to ask those questions um, mm -hmm. out of a sense of propriety, but also because what we were taught about faith is that you don't question it. Of course. You don't question God. You don't question in the Bible. You accept the Bible as the inerrant, um, in God breathed, God inspired word. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Jesus is the living embodiment of the word. Um, you never question that, that that's what faith is, is accepting um, the, the, the mystery, right? Um, so that's what on the one hand is that, you know, you these are the things we can't say. We can't have any doubts or curiosities or questions. We have to just simply accept um, without question. We have to simply obey without question. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, it was, um, you, you described it as, um, it was, it was, uh, um, choosing not to, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. making the exactly. conscious choice of yeah. we're not going to, to, to say what this yes. is. And so yeah. the culture of silence in the church mm -hmm. is what allows, harm and dysfunction to be perpetuated. And uh -huh. so I was curious about those silences and that's part of the secrets is what are the things that, you know, we only say to ourselves or we only maybe say to one other person, you know, uh -huh. what are the things that we, um, are, you know, are thinking or desiring, but we won't speak them um, mm -hmm. even as we're acting on them. And so the church further models that because uh, the church was the first institution to have the act, don't ask, don't tell mm -hmm. policy. Right. And in the black church, um, it's not uncommon to have, um, you know, someone who's in charge of the music ministry or the choir that people, you know, understand, you know, wink, nudge um, that they're gay, mm -hmm. but they can never bring a partner to the church. They can never, you can't say the gay. Mm -hmm. It's just understood. Yes. You know, it's yes. understood or, um, you know, past or may other married men in the church are having extramarital affairs and um, we don't talk about it until it's exposed and then we can excuse that away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was tempted. The devil is always busy, you know, and, and, and who's the temptation? It's always a woman. Mm -hmm. um, we have Eve to thank for that. And that whole narrative that women are temptresses and men are helpless before them. Uh -huh. um, and then we forgive the man or, you know, he, the man asks for forgiveness. We've seen these public um, demonstrations of, of, of black male pastors in pulpits, you know, speaking to their scandals um, and then they're forgiven and then they continue to have scandals, you know, <laughs> and it's like, we all see this happening, but we're not supposed to talk about it. We're not supposed uh -huh. to complain. We're not supposed to notice the double standards uh -huh. um, or any of those things. And so um, that's part of that second piece that you identified. The other part is something in church culture that's called, um, and not just limited to church culture, you know, the spirit versus the letter of the law. Mm, yes. You know? yes. And so there's this explain idea. to us what that is. Yes. Yeah. So it's the <laughs> idea that, um, you know, um, we see it in Eula, right? So the, 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 the Christianity is basically you ask, you know, Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, and you know, um, Jesus died in your place because the wages or the cost of sin is death. So Jesus died for our sins. So mm. we are forgiven if we profess Christ. Mm. Um, and so as kids, the thing that was tricky for us was, okay, if I do this and 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 Jesus forgives all of my sins, can I just keep sinning? <laughs> you know, can I just, you know, and then be like, it's forgiven, right? Like, so why can't I just do? It? And it's like, well, you know, if Jesus was really in your heart, you would want to sin, you know. Uh -huh. but, uh -huh. but the so the spirit of of this is that you don't conduct yourself in ways you don't sin. Yeah. Um, but the law says I can do these things and be forgiven. So what uh -huh. do we see? The Eula having sex. She's not married. She's having sex with a woman. Um, but she prays about it before and after, you know, uh -huh. 
Uh-huh. Um, and, yes. and that's, that's not, I mean, my story is an invention. It's a product of my imagination, but I went to high school and college with uh, young people who were Christians who thought if as long as they had, uh, they prayed before or after or both having sex, that it was okay. Mm-hmm. you know yeah. um and yeah. so it's this idea that if you know it, it's what we choose to say and how we choose to frame these things yeah. um and if we you know and, and it, it it's the simplified way of being human it's overly simplified mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and and it and it's very confining mm-hmm. um and that's mm-hmm. what i was hoping to to show in the stories yes and uh, we'll be talking a lot about this idea of of confinement as well um mm-hmm. and the things that we adopt which confine us the things which are forced upon us as confinements um what i want to identify here i mean everything you said is is just so rich and i think that this question of interpretation is also at the center of everything because there is what is logically before us and then there is our interpretation of it which also feeds into ideas of storytelling and narrative um and it's also interesting what you've said because it also shows the contradiction inherent in the notion of the secret where mm-hmm. these are secrets that everyone knows exist and they're only right. secret by the fact of not being spoken. Um, and so it's yet another tension, yet another contradiction. Um, what you said about the kind of fact that one qu- can't question the church um, and this very, the idea of the law, it's it's brought me to what I think is maybe the central theme of this work, though you wouldn't think about it um, when you first read it, which is the, the, the idea of power um an authority i think first of all when we talk about sex we're always talking about power um but there's also many other dynamics of power um that one sees in this book that one sees our characters trying to navigate both with the church with their families within their relationships then their positions in society um this is made all the more significant when we consider the fact that all of the characters all the narrators in this book are black women who are in this position in society where they're they are in a society that is structurally positioned to disempower them and they are trying to navigate pathways out of that. So tell me about the role that power plays in the stories in this work and in your writing more generally. So, um, well, you've named the relationships, you know, power, black women's power vis-a-vis the church, um, Mm -hmm. our power vis-a-vis our mothers, our power Mm -hmm. vis-a-vis our partners um, and our own fears, you know, and do we feel that we have no power um, mm. or do we find ways to um, assert the power that we, we do have. Mm-hmm. Um, how do we get free? How do we exercise the power that we have? And mm-hmm. so, you know, taking the relationship with the fir- church first, I, um, you know, I always say that, you know, this version of Christianity, um, cause I recognize there are many expressions and in, in theologies of Christianity. Mm-hmm. The one that I'm, the tradition I'm writing about is the perfect con, right? Um, it is established in a way where the power, the hierarchy of power is never disrupted. Mm. Um, whether it's, you know, God in us, the pastor and the, you know, the, the congregation, there are mm. always these hierarchies. Men are always on top. Women are always on the bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's reinforced by what we talked about earlier, which is you don't question it, mm-hmm. right? And so if, you, if you're not supposed to question it, then nothing will ever change. You know, you're just supposed to accept Mm -hmm. it. Um, So then what happens if you do question? Um, If, or what happens if you decide to live outside of the bounds of the law and of the rules? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you're going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. There's no better way to keep people in line by saying, you know, you are going to, you know, burn in in eternal fire, you know, and (laughs) you don't fall in line. Uh And this is the this is how the con works. You introduce people, introduce this to people when they're children, mm. when they're impressionable, mm. when they are um, black and white thinkers, when mm. you know nuance would be lost on you. <laughs> it is lost on children mm. often. Um, mm. When um, the idea of you know um, God, you know that uh, you know there's the God and there's the devil and there, you know, so it plays into our, our interest in mythology as children mm-hmm. that we're so malleable. Um, mm-hmm. and we want nothing more than to be thought good. Um, and so we're told that there, there's no continuum, right? Uh-huh. You're either good or bad. You're going to heaven or hell. Um, 
you're either straight or gay. And if you're gay, you're going to hell. Um, and then for women, you're a Madonna or you're a whore. You know, there's no, there's nothing, there's no in between. And so if people are forced to choose, if you're given these binaries and the, if you make the wrong choice, you're, you know, it's terrible. It's very easy to say, okay, I, I need to, this is what I need to do. But then we're human. And it's like, oh, this is hard. I, I have desires. I have, you know, it, it's it's not easy to to do this. Um, so I have to pretend and I have to perform and now I've got to hide that. And all along, we want the people above us to see us as good, as see us. They don't, we don't want that. We want to be like the duck. We don't want you to see us, you know, paddling furiously beneath the surface. Uh-huh, exactly, exactly. Just that um, way. And yes. so we don't challenge authority. So again, our power mm-hmm. is, is, is maintained. Um, the power dynamics in terms of, you know, men and women, as I alluded to earlier, you know, from the very beginning with the story of Adam and Eve is Eve mm-hmm. as a woman is set up as, um, you know, cursed and as lesser and as, um, you know, made from the man's body. We're derivative. Um, are the things that make that that we uh, that are unique to to us and that men don't have, you know, in terms of um, um, or people who are born male don't have having a period. That's a curse. Mm-hmm. You know, all of the ways that we're told that it is, you know, that those of us who are are uh, identify as female that we are we are automatically lesser. Mm-hmm. Um, in certain churches, women can't preach um, at all, or they can't preach or teach men. Mm -hmm. Um, so we see that those hierarchies of power are set up Mm -hmm. then in our homes the power dynamics and all of these rules and binaries um and uh black and white thinking are replicated and Mm -hmm. so it's reinforced so the things we're taught in church are reinforced at home and the things that we're taught at home are reinforced at church Mm -hmm. um you know you're and and uh, the bible says to honor your father and mother so again don't ask questions that, you know, you have to d- respect them no matter what. Mm. So they maintain this power over you. So mm. you enter the world as a woman and you don't enter thinking I'm a powerful being. It's, mm. I'm just trying not to go to hell. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just trying, trying to, make to make it through the favor <laughs> and stay on in the good graces of the people uh-huh. around me that yeah. my, um, my highest calling can, is to serve other people. Mm. is to please other people, is Mm. to fall neatly into these boxes, is to not ask questions, is to not have desires, our own independent desires, um, is not to disrupt, um, Mm. but to soothe. There's uh, in Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, there's the Proverbs, excuse me, Proverbs 31 woman is Proverbs chapter 31. And uh, I'm working on a novel and uh, in, in it, I refer to the Proverbs 31 woman as like the Beyonce of evangelicals, right? Like every, you know, the, um, e- you know, evangelical Christian women um, had a moment, especially in the early and mid uh, 2000s, 2010. Uh-huh. Um, it was, you know, I'm, I'm a Proverbs 31 woman, you know, and that meant that you, you know, and it's like, you know, she rises with the, the sun and she doesn't go to bed until midnight and she's sewing her family's clothes and she's uh-huh. getting the food and she's speaking well of her husband at the gate at the city gates and yeah she just I'm like when does she sleep (laughs) (laughs) isn't she tired (laughs) she should be exhausted but that's the thing that we're an endless font of giving and serving and and, Mm. and caretaking Mm. um not um creating for our own purposes not Mm. Um, being um, individuals, you know, Mm -hmm. we're always defined in relation to um, other people. Mm -hmm. Um, So a very disempowered um, position, not defined Mm -hmm. as a leader. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's how those power relationships, you know, show up. And you spoke specifically about Black women and, and that's, you know, that's who I am. And and that's, those are the women that I come from. Mm -hmm. And so we have been the additional burden of slavery Mm. and the the legacy of slavery. Um, Slavery worked because of a story. Just Mm. like the Bible, you know, Christianity works because of a story. Mm. Um, The story that uh, was told about enslaved Africans was that we weren't human. So Mm. it was fine to enslave us. You're not enslaving people, you're enslaving animals. Mm. Um, 
along that line, it was, oh, and you can also rape and breed the women because they're not human. Also, they're really promiscuous. Um, and so, you you know, and we know that, you know, pr promiscuous women are unrapeable. And so that was the narrative that was told about us in slavery. So coming out of slavery, what our, you know, uh, formerly enslaved ancestors did is form churches because mm -hmm. churches were, you know, uh, enslaved people were made to attend churches, church on many plantations. And some enslaved people became pastors. They were chosen by the slave, you know, the plantation owners to, um, to preach mm -hmm. and teach things like what the Bible says, slaves obey your masters, you know, it reinforces the rules and the power uh, hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so after slavery, the church became the cornerstone institution for newly emancipated Black folks. And mm -hmm. so, you know, our first colleges and our first schools and colleges and universities were originally churches. Our mm -hmm. gathering spaces were churches. The civil rights movement <clears throat> was rooted in churches. Um, and so in those institutions, what are the laws? What are the rules? We've talked about them. We're reinforcing patriarchy mm -hmm. um, and we're reinforcing white supremacy at the same time, even though, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's um, amongst black people. Mm -hmm. um, and so the ways that black women are viewed it's again, I've got to prove to you, I am human. I am not um, to be, you know, I'm not a breeder. I am not sexually promiscuous. So we're aiming to show you, cause there's no nuance, right? So if I'm not those things, I have to be absolutely pure and chaste mm. and there will be nothing in between. And so mm -hmm. anyone who gets out of line is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how, as, Black folks, we embraced those um, those church, the church's teachings and, and and made them our own in our own churches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting too because such a central um, source of agony in in the work and in what you're saying is this idea of recognition that all these characters are seeking to be recognized as as themselves, first of all, as human beings with needs, desires, hungers, as daughters, as lovers, um, and they're constantly refused this recognition. Um, and so their, their desire to be recognized is never satisfied. Um, and I wanna talk more about this idea of, of desire, of satisfaction in the face of um, these structures surrounding them, which are restricting them and confining them. So we have this cast of women who are hungry. They have bodily desires, they have needs, they have been born into a set of stories that demand one kind of uh, procedure of action from them. And then they have this crazy body that's like demanding they do all these other things in order, in order to keep it satisfied and happy and fulfilled. Um, and so they have the restriction, they have the desire. And so you start to wonder, whether or not these external rules are the ones that are creating the desires for mm -hmm. them or if um, the desires are innate to them. And so I'm curious what you think about this relationship between repression of mm -hmm. desire and satisfaction of desire mm -hmm. and what you see your characters as doing in order to satisfy their desires. And finally, if you think your characters ultimately satisfy them, do you think that satisfaction is possible? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love this question. Um, I think that, you know, I'll, I'll talk about it through the lens of Eula, which is the, yes. the first story in the collection that we talked about. And mm -hmm. one of the things I love talking with readers about uh, is whether or not Eula and Caroletta are gay or queer or bi or um, mm -hmm. um, lesbian, you know, mm -hmm. labels that you know, mean something to all of us and that means something in the broader culture. Mm -hmm. And so I think, so I asked myself that question because it's not something I had, you know, I don't have an answer. And then like, oh, there are these two bisexual women and I'm going to write their story. Mm -hmm. For me, truly, it was, there are these two women who are faced with this, um, you know, cultural, what I call cultural Christianity that tells them you need to wait for a husband. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't wait, you know, hell and, you know, fire and brimstone and all of that. Um, and you have to wait for the man, the man that mm. God is going to, to send you. And mm. in a lot of uh, some, you know, evangelical traditions, women are cautioned 
against even being alone with men. Mm. Um, and we, we, I think it made it into the, the larger public consciousness when um, Mike Pence was vice president and he was saying how he would never ever be alone with a woman ever. And that's- I, I miss this. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, he would never be alone with a woman. And that was part of, of his, you know, his evangelical background which is, you know, men and women are never to be alone because, you know, you're going, you could be tempted and you don't want to create an environment where there's temptation, right? And so I was thinking about the fact that if you grew up, if you were raised in a tradition like that um, and you got to be 40 years old and you were not married and you had sexual desires um, mm -hmm. and you were told that masturbation is also sinful, mm -hmm. so you know, you can't even do that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do? And you're around women all the time. Mm. And so, you know, you're going to be drawn to the people who are around you. So that was kind of, you know, I was thinking about these two friends who are in this, um, for them, it's a dilemma of being single at 40 and mm. being told to wait on their Boaz, so waiting mm. for the man that God sends mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And then around the same time, I was having a conversation with a, a, a friend of mine, a guy um, who was lamenting that, you know, he doesn't have a problem with, you know, gay people or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. But all these girls are saying that they're bi and he thinks it's just a trend. Mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's just a trend. And so I said, I asked him, I was like, why do you, why are you doubtful? Mm -hmm. And he said, because when we were growing up, girls weren't doing this stuff with each other. And I said, how do you know? Hmm, yes. <laughs> Interesting. That's and a his hypothesis. <laughs> uh. And I said, you all only knew what we told you or what uh -huh. we showed you. Uh -huh. so you don't know. And uh -huh. he finally said, touche. And uh -huh. so it, I brought that to kind of bear with these two women I had been thinking about, two church women, church ladies. And I was like, what if that was their secret? Mm. That, you know? Mm. They had these desires and um, they didn't want to, you know, break the law mm -hmm. uh, that said that they weren't supposed to have sex with men. Um, mm -hmm. But again, when you start playing the spirit of the law versus, you know, but homosexuality is also considered a sin. Mm -hmm. But if we pray about it and if we only do it once a year, <laughs> it might be okay. <laughs> Right. You know, you, you kind of rationalize anything. And in the case yeah. of Eula, she just, she literally won't talk about it, won't mm. acknowledge it, even mm. if, as they're doing it, you mm. know? Mm. And then Caroletta mm. is different. Caroletta, you know, um, is our point of view character and we're inside her head. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, if I had to imagine a world beyond the story as it's written, um, you know, Caroletta would be all in to mm. move to another town and have a whole open relation, you know, a whole relationship out in the open mm -hmm. with Eula mm -hmm. because she loves her mm -hmm. um, and romantically. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, I don't know that Caroletta is at all interested in the label of I'm gay, I'm a gay woman, or I'm a bisexual mm -hmm. woman, or I'm a queer woman. Caroletta would say to you, I love Eula. Hmm. And I'm not saying this to say there's anything wrong with labeling our, our desires or our identities or whatever, but for hmm. these particular characters, I think it shows the complexity of it, especially as women who have been told that all of those labels are wrong or bad. Hmm. That I can understand why they might hesitate to embrace the label or embrace even a community. Hmm. Um, for Caroletta, it's like, I, I love this woman. And that's, you know, it's as simple as that. No, no, and it no. means that some people think I'm going to hell, fine, I'll go to hell, you know? Um, so I think I answered a little bit. Yes. <laughs> what you yes, certainly, yes. And it's so interesting what you say, because it brings us back to what we were talking about in the beginning, this tension between um, refusing to name things and not being able to name things. And you've completely identified a kind of third category that I hadn't considered, which is the failure of the name, the fact that naming something cannot actually account for the complexity, the wholeness of the object that it's naming, the object being a human being with this complex network of desires. Mm -hmm. um, and I think 
what's interesting about the Eula story as well um, is that it's it's to a certain degree about women who have needs that are not being met that satisfy those needs in each other, but it's also really deeply tragic and a really sad story. And I think there's a real current of tragedy and sadness that runs throughout this book. Mm -hmm. And it's very caught up in an idea of guilt and shame, the, mm -hmm. the kind of curse of the satisfaction of desire that upon realizing your desire, um, you are punished with, you punish yourself, you become the, the agent of your own misery. Um, I think we see this with Eula. We see this particularly in the peach cobbler story, which I'd like to talk about. Um, I'd actually like to read really briefly um, with a very short amount of time, but you have this just devastating visceral scene in the peach cobbler story. For those who haven't read the book, um, this is a character whose mother bakes peach cobbler for their pastor before she proceeds to have their married pastor um, and then has sex with him. And the daughter just really wants this peach cobbler because she really wants to be seen and loved by her mother. She never is. One day her mother dumps the peach cobbler in the trash and the daughter in the middle of the night gets up, goes before the trash can, kind of bends down and, and proceeds to devour this peach cobbler for the first time. Um, and she writes, in the darkness, I reached down into the garbage can until my fingertips were wet and sticky. I grabbed a handful of the cobbler and shoved it all in my mouth at once. The sugary juice dribbled over the corner of my mouth down to my chin as I chewed. I savored the peaches and the soft bits of crust soaked through with the syrup. Nothing had ever tasted so good. From memory, I pictured every movement of my mother's hands, how she dunked the peaches in boiling water, then ran them under cold tap water to slide the peels off. The easy way she wielded the knife to sli slice the peaches, the care she took to drain canned peaches when Georgia peaches were out of season. And then when she's caught by her mother, there's a scene, her mother is right behind her, says, what are you doing? And it says, tears streaked down my cheeks and my sticky fingers were still in my mouth. I bit down on them, not sure how to answer her and afraid not to answer. And it's just such a beautiful, remarkable scene of just relinquishing to urge to the body to need. And in this case, it's not sexual need, it's food, it's hunger. But we realize that all these different needs, these are all just different symptoms of the same feeling of need and of lack. And it's accompanied here by punishment. It's accompanied with Eula by regret, guilt, so what is the role of guilt and shame in this book? And is it inevitable when one gives in to desire? Um, I don't think it's inevitable, mm. uh, depending on how you were introduced to desire, you know, mm. how, and, 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 you know, if we want to kind of um, code desire as sex, for example, but as you said, in this example, um, you know, it's not sex, but what if as children, we were told, we were taught, if our first notions of what, um, you know, eating something decadent was, or when we're first taught about sex, mm -hmm. is pleasure. What mm -hmm. if it was pleasure? But mm -hmm. for most of us, it's always um, rules, mm -hmm. whether it's rules around sex or rules around don't eat too much sugar, or mm -hmm. you can only have one piece of cake, or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, all of these things. And so, the idea to want something in abundance or want something simply because it feels good mm -hmm. from an early age, many of us are taught to deny what feels good. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it too, you can't, you shouldn't have too much of a good thing or you they say you can't have too much of a good thing, but what we're taught is don't have too much mm -hmm. of a good thing. Mm -hmm. We're taught, um, especially in, you know, evangelical Christianity, with evangelical Christianity, we're taught mm -hmm. to, um, um, fear the body and distrust the body, the flesh, mm -hmm. you know, the world, the flesh, you know, all of those things. And, and even language of the, the, your flesh is your enemy. Mm -hmm. And so you're pitted from a very early age, you're pitted against your own body and your own desires. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think fear, guilt and, and shame, and I'll talk about why I talk about all three of those in a sec. Yes. I don't think they're innate to us. I mm -hmm. think that we're taught to be suspicious of our bodies, to mm -hmm. um, to confine our bodies, to limit our pleasure. We're not taught to embrace pleasure, especially mm -hmm. as women. We're not taught to embrace mm -hmm. uh, what feels right to us. We're taught to second guess ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not taught to listen to our intuition. We're taught that you know um, 
you have, you know, all again about the devil, but the devil is, is, is busy and is going to, you know, um, lead you astray. The world is going to lead you astray. Mm -hmm. um, there is an organization called the Incarnation Institute um, for Sex and Faith, mm -hmm. which um, has a mission to break down that sort of um, unnatural and untrue dichotomy between um, how people who um, embrace faith and religion um, and, and, and how they view sex mm. and to address a lot of the sexual dysfunction that comes with harmful church teachings. Mm. And uh, they offer a training course for therapists and for clergy and sex educators. Um, and they invited me in because of my book and I got to, to do the training. And oh. one of the things that they talk about is fear, guilt, and shame and they call it the unholy trinity, which I think is just a perfect, you know, um, uh -huh. vision, exactly. you know, per perfect imagery yes. of um, how many of us are taught desire or how to mm -hmm. regard desire, our own desires, be they sexual or otherwise. So mm -hmm. absolutely, I don't think it's, um, it's a natural mindset it's one that we can and hopefully will um, each of us have the opportunity to unlearn mm -hmm. if that's how we have been taught to think about pleasure or desire. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting too, the idea, what you say about um, how it leads to sexual dysfunction. It, it leads mm -hmm. to the unhealthy relationships with emerge, which we also see in this work, right? Um, that sex is is not um something that is wholly positive or negative in a sense it contains both of these poles mm -hmm. and it's more that the more it is repressed and thwarted in the bodies of these characters the more it kind of emerges from them as something which causes harm um and which which damages them um there's there's so much more that i want to talk to you uh about i'm going to ask you one more question and then we will turn to our Zoom audience. Um, so Zoom audience, please send questions into the chat. They will be read aloud and discussed. Um, I wanna talk about care in this book because I think both care is really central to the work and care has also become a word that's really trendy right now. It's used very heavily in contemporary writing circles um, and contemporary theory circles to the point that it's, its meaning becomes loose, but its importance has become really emphasized. And so I'd like to know what care means to you and how you've written it into this work. Um, that I had never thought about this question before. Um, so this is really kind of off the cuff, but I'm thinking about care through the lens of what you said earlier about freedom. Mm -hmm. um, because care, taking um mm -hmm. can be a kind of servitude mm -hmm. as, you know for women mm -hmm. um and and we're sort of relegated to it and we're supposed to be natural at it and endlessly you know tirelessly um able to care for everybody else first mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not prioritize our own care mm -hmm. um and so one of the acts, one of the ways we get free, I think, is to re-examine and re-establish our relationships with care. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the characters, um, you know, my characters in the stories do that in, in different ways. And so Lyra is a character in a story, um, How to Make Love to a Physicist. Mm -hmm. And it's how she cares for her body yes. that helps to free her up to be open to a relationship with someone else. That Her first priority though, had to be um, how she took care of her body, mm -hmm. um, what she ate, mm -hmm. um, how she touched herself, how she, she viewed her body as not something to be tamed or contained, but to literally have her physical body be free. So mm -hmm. she had to, you know, ex take that journey for herself. And then I think about um, daughter who doesn't have a name. She's only just daughter because that's her function in the family. She takes care of everybody um, and including her brothers. Yes. And then when we meet her uh, in this story, 
she is the caretaker for her mother who um, has a, a form of dementia. And her mother wasn't the mother she needed her to be. Um, her mother wasn't the best caretaker of her when she was a child and now their roles have been reversed. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very curious because of the relationships between mothers and daughters in my own family and mm -hmm. caretaking of elderly mothers who um, you know, weren't the mothers that you needed them to be. I watched my mother have that experience and I watched my grandmother have that experience, mm -hmm. but I never talked to them about what that was like. And so this is a story of me kind of imagining what that was like mm -hmm. um, and the tension, mm -hmm. you know? And so daughter has to navigate um, that and, you know, her role as a caretaker, mm -hmm. um, her anger at her mother, the mm -hmm. hurt that she's felt, how does she, the grief over the relationship they didn't have and what she didn't get from her mother. And then she has a brother, her one living brother who um, doesn't, you know, he doesn't see, he doesn't feel the same obligation to their mother uh, mm -hmm. that she does. And why oh, is that? Yes. You yeah. Know, yeah. Have to that. yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's, I think the idea of care shows up in who, as, as women, as black women in particular, how do we prioritize care for ourselves and how do we renegotiate mm -hmm. the expect expectations of us mm -hmm. as caretakers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are we supposed to be caring towards parents who were negligent towards us? Mm -hmm. The Bible mm -hmm. says we are, <laughs> you know, but what do we say? Mm -hmm. And it's answering yes. and making those decisions for ourselves and then living with the decisions we make without feeling guilty or ashamed or fear of, you know, some afterlife in which, you know, a sky daddy is going to, you know, say you didn't, you didn't honor your mother and father. Uh huh. Yes, and I love that you've uh, you've you've used the word sky daddy um, because I I actually I would like to talk about God and I would like to talk about God in this book because I don't think he's in this book and um and I'm I'm wondering where he is and I think specifically in Dear Sister you make mm -hmm. this lovely link um, between the absent physical father and God as the absent father. Um, and it seems to me that these women, what they may be seeking at the end of the day is some form of God or divinity um, in the sense of the, the absolute realization of their desires. You see it even in um, the final story between mama and daughter when she's kind of uses um, the figure of the singer whose whose name I have now forgotten. Um, Eddie Levert. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, uh, as this figure that will kind of like Christ will, you know, she's always waiting for him to arrive um, and announce himself. And so I just want to know where where is the divinity in this work? Do you think that these women believe in God? Do they need God? Do you think that that belief in God um, is good for them? Does it help them in some ways? And in what ways is that harmful for them? Um, oh gosh, they, I think they're all grappling with it in different ways. I mean, if we just stick with dear sister yeah. um, and the, you know, the four sisters, you know, the way that they each sort of um, make peace with their relate or not their relationship with their father, their biological father. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, how do they regard uh, their regard God. Mm -hmm. And so I think about um, the character Renee, the sister who most wants to believe in their deadbeat dad, yes, most yes. is the most Christian, is the most, yes, exactly, you know, yes. you know? It's, it's the same <laughs> of, of, of belief in the, in the object that's not there. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and the, um, you know, telling yourself the story, what story does she need to tell herself that, you know, she's a good daughter and he's a good father, all of the evidence, the contrary, that he's a good father. Um, but it's the same thing with God. We have this book, a Bible, and then we have church people who tell us who God is, but we all get to, for ourselves, decide if that's our experience, you know? And so we have Renee on one end of the spectrum, and then we have Tashita, her, her one half sister, um, on the other end, who is a complete hedonist, Mm -hmm. And, you know, who um, has no, you know, does not seem to operate with any concern about fear or shame or guilt. Yeah. Um, yeah. But she also isn't unaware. 
you know, uh -huh. because when, when Renee scolds her and says, you should speak honorably of our father because the Bible says such and such, she comes back and says, but you know what? The Bible also says, <laughs> you know, that he, you know, he was not, he, you know, he, you know, Renee understands that, you know, she has, she's like so many of us, we were raised in a church, we were told what you're supposed to believe. So it's like, I know what you're talking about, Renee. You're not talking, you know, she, she just needed to let Renee know I'm not some heathen that I don't, that, you know, you're, you're going to, you're not going to school me. Mm -hmm. I have processed this information for myself and this is where I have landed. Um, and so I would say that Renee doesn't think about God the same way she doesn't think about her biological father. Mm -hmm. um, she's mm -hmm. just not, con she's not concerned um, with, pleasing anybody or anyone's expectation she's also not um pining away you know mm -hmm. um and and, mm -hmm. and i'll speak to sort of uh i love the question you know where's god in the book mm -hmm. i i know that my own experience of of god and having been in the church and not in the church certainly influences that because for me that was what finally showed me that I was going to leave, made me think I'm leaving the church. I don't know why I'm here. It's because I didn't feel all those things that people said, if you're a Christian, this is what your experience of God is. It's very much prescribed, mm -hmm. or at least it was for me. And for long, uh, for so many years, long before I left the church, I didn't feel it. Mm -hmm. I was faking it. And mm -hmm. I was still journals writing about how I just wanted to experience God the way it was in all the hymns and the way that, you know, they said in Bible study and in sermons, mm -hmm. desperate to feel it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was finally honest about that, that's when I left the church. And mm -hmm. so I think that shows up in my stories where each of these women are saying, here's what I experienced of God. And it ranges from, you know, uh, 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 mother characters who are focused on, you know, here's what the Bible says, and here's what I believe. And then there are others who are, you know, I'm trying to follow, but something's missing, you know, and I'm still praying to this God because I'm supposed to, but something's missing. And then characters like Tashida who are like, I don't know that guy, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, the like, God, I've not, not, not relevant to her life at all you know mm, mm, it's amazing because it, it brings us back to i think what it strikes me is the central point of this discussion which is the idea that we are we live in this very strange world surrounded by fictions that don't correspond to our immediate perception and mm -hmm. so all of these women in a sense are trying to navigate trusting their perception their immediate instinct versus everything the world is telling them which is totally a contradiction with what they feel and what they see and what they are trying to speak um, in these different ways. Um, and it's just been such a pleasure speaking with you. I'm looking at the time now and feeling nervous because I have so many que more questions and we are meant to be taking questions from Zoom. Um, people on Zoom, please do send those questions in if you have them, because if not, I will just keep on talking. Um, in the interest of time, I would like to get to some questions which are less kind of of the abstract metaphysical and more to do with your own career as it currently stands. So you're currently adapting this work into a TV show for HBO Max. How has that process been of transforming um, the voices of these characters into script? How has it been kind of giving them flesh and spring them to light? Um, and what has that revealed to you about the characters that you maybe didn't know about them when you were writing them for short stories? So the, there's so many wonderful things about the being able to adapt for television because it's like I get to visit my characters again. It's like going back and visiting friends or family um, because for whatever reason, I had no desire to write a sequel to any of these stories. I had no desire to write a novel or turn any of them into a novel. It was yeah. sort of like, they're kind of in amber in a way. Yes. And yet the idea of revisiting them in another medium, that was exciting to me because I could take as much or as little as I wanted from the stories mm -hmm. um, and then, and, 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 uh, and take the characters really and, um, and imagine something else 
right? Mm -hmm. Taking the things that I love about the characters and their stories and that readers love. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, being able to imagine something different. Mm -hmm. And so where we are, I'm working with a, a co-writer and mm -hmm. where we've landed, we've been working on this for over a year. Mm -hmm. um, we are focusing primarily on Olivia from Peach Cobbler and Instructions for Married Christian Husbands. Yes. Um, Gile from Gile. Fantastic. And they sure. were teenagers um, in, in the book, but now we've made them in their 30s. And okay. their stories are set in the present. How fascinating. And we build a whole world around them. And there's um, a key event that I don't want to spoil that happens in Gile um, that is central to this, you know, the story in, in, in season one. Yes. Um, and we make Gile and Olivia, um, they were friendly as teenagers and then they connect, they bond. And then they, as they got older, they kind of, you know, became, um, uh, not disenchanted their relationship, you know, didn't remain. Um, and then when we meet them in, in this TV world, they are reunited. Mm. And so to answer your question, um, some things are the same. You know, yeah. Olivia is sleeping with married men. Um, Olivia's mother is still there. And okay. their relationship, um, you know, when she was growing up was what you described. So they've never dealt with that. But mm -hmm. she is still in Olivia's life. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's complicated. And then we have new characters who have who aren't in the book at all. Oh, so. delightful. And so have, have the characters surprised you in any way as you've kind of Absolutely. <laughs> really? And you know, I think what allowed me the characters to surprise me is working with a fantastic co-writer who yeah. loves the book, loves the story, loves the characters, but she's not wedded to them the way I am. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. she'll write a scene and do things with the characters that I'm like, oh, okay, you ah, know, like I did, yeah. uh, all right. And, you know, and so I really, um, you know, Tor uh, Tori kicked us off and wrote the very first scene. It's not the first scene now that it's in the pilot, but the first scene we ever wrote, she wrote the first one and I mm -hmm. was just gobsmacked. <laughs> like, okay, this is what we're doing? I can do that. Yeah, okay, and, all right, you know, I'm, I'm on board. Yeah. You know, we just sort of played off of each other. And so um, it was inevitable that they were going to surprise me because Tori was having them surprise me on the page. Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized that I could also give them the space to surprise me as I was writing them, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that we are, we've hit the sweet spot between, you know, people who read the book and are going to look to the TV show for something familiar. They're going to get that as well as something new. And then yeah. if you've never read the book, you'll still be able to get into it. 